The Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics at Seattle Children's Hospital presents its fifth annual conference, No Longer a Child, Not Yet an Adult, Ethical Issues in Adolescent Healthcare. The Truman Katz Center is the nation's first center dedicated solely to the study of ethics relating to research and healthcare for children. The title of my talk is Asking the Right Questions and What the Implications for Adolescent Decision Making of That. And uh, the short answer to this is, I think, is that I think in bioethics in particular, we've been asking the wrong questions uh, about adolescent capacity to make decisions. And, and uh, hopefully at the end of my 30 minutes, I'll, suggest, uh, I'll have suggested why that is. Um, I'm going to first start with a couple of cases and then discuss our current approach to adolescent decision making, which I'll suggest is an autonomy-based approach uh, in terms of deciding when, <clears throat> say, a 14 or a 16-year-old is capable of making medical decisions that ought to be um, abided by. Uh, then I'm going to say a little bit about the adolescent brain, and uh, finally suggest a more nuanced approach to uh, understanding adolescent decision making uh, and, and how that might impact the way we approach adolescents who perhaps uh, don't want to uh, follow suggested uh, medical regimens. So first some cases. Um, <clears throat> I want to start with a couple of uh, cases that many of you will be familiar with in part because I think it grounds the discussion quite well. Uh, in the, the last several months the media has been uh, uh, full of reports about a, a young man named Daniel Hauser, a 13-year-old who lives in Sleepy Eye, Minnesota. Daniel has, uh, was recently diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, given a 90% chance of cure with conventional therapy, and had already undergone one round of chemotherapy. Um, Daniel also considers himself to be a medicine man in the church, and, and a church elder, elder in something known as Nimanha, which is an American Indian religious organization. Now, <clears throat> after having gone through one uh, episode of chemotherapy, uh, Daniel apparently was feeling considerably better and uh, started making claims with the support of his parents that further treatment would violate his religious beliefs, that in his mind, chemotherapy is self-destructive and poisonous. And uh, he expressed a desire to pursue an alternative regimen of complementary <clears throat> medicine, which included dietary changes and ionized water. Uh, he further stated that he would punch uh, and fight if he was uh, challenged in, uh, and, and forced to undergo chemotherapy. Daniel's case was challenged in court. Um, the district judge uh, spent a fair amount of time with Daniel trying to determine whether he was mature enough to make this decision and came to the following conclusions. First of all, that Daniel does not believe he's currently ill. Uh, probably in large part because the first round of chemotherapy had made him feel considerably better, that he had a rudimentary understanding of, at best, of the risks and benefits of chemotherapy and therefore was not a mature enough minor to make this sort of decision. He therefore ordered Daniel and his mother <clears throat> to report for a chest x-ray to, to assess the progression of his disease, uh, to select an oncologist, and uh, to follow the instructions of that oncologist. And, and his, uh, what the judge said was that unless the tumor had advanced to the point where chemotherapy would not help, the family had to agree to treatment. Uh, if Daniel or the family refused, they'd be, he would be placed in temporary custody. Um, and at that point, uh, what became very newsworthy was that Daniel and his mother disappeared, headed for the border. Um, and ultimately ended up coming back of their own accord to Minnesota where presumably Daniel is currently being treated. In another case which is um, near and dear to the hearts of those of us in Seattle, uh, a young man named Dennis Lindbergh um, who uh, was uh, I believe 14 at the time uh, described himself as a practicing Jehovah's Witness. Uh, Dennis uh, had been uh, put in the custody of his aunt, his parents uh, had lost custody because of drug use issues, and um, his parents were not Jehovah's Witnesses. His aunt, however, was, and shortly after joining <clears throat> her home, uh, living with her, he, he converted to the Jehovah's Witness religion, and um, shortly thereafter was diagnosed with acute lymphocytic leukemia. In his case, he was given a 70% chance of uh, uh, long-term cure if he underwent uh, the prescribed regimen. Uh, 
Now, as most people know, treatment for leukemia destroys most of the blood cells, and therefore these kids inevitably will need transfusions. Chemotherapy was started in Daniel's case. Um, because of low blood counts, it was stopped, and at that point, uh, the stalemate uh, occurred, which was that Daniel said, I don't want, or Dennis said, rather, I don't want transfusions, and the oncology team said, well, we can't continue to treat you without transfusions, and as a matter of fact, we've treated you to pass the point of no return. Dennis uh, persisted in his objection. He, similar to Daniel Hauser, suggested that he would uh, use physical as well as um, verbal resistance if uh, there was an attempt to transfuse him. Uh, in, in Dennis's case, this went to the Skagit County Superior Court judge of Washington State, and in this case, the judge decided that after having heard testimony, he felt Dennis was a mature minor, uh, knew the consequences of his decision, knew what he was doing, knew that he would die without a transfusion, and um, allowed him to be the decision maker. And uh, within about 24 hours, Dan uh, Dennis Lindbergh had died of um, um, a low red blood cell count. So given those two cases, uh, two very different court rulings, I want to now talk about what our current approach is to thinking about when an adolescent might or might not make the sort of medical decision that ought to be respected. And I'm going to suggest um, <clears throat> that in the background here is um, a notion I think we all recognize, which is that there's nothing particularly age-dependent about any of this, that uh, as William Blake says, neither youth nor childhood is folly or incapacity. Some children are fools, and so are some old men, <clears throat> including the one in the picture. Um, <clears throat> we all know that there are plenty of 30 and 40-year-olds, <clears throat> excuse me, who make very foolish decisions about their medical care. Uh, most pediatricians have taken care of 14 and 15 year olds who seem to be wise beyond their years. Um, and, and, and so uh, right off the bat, I think we need to recognize that, that age alone will never be a sufficient means of sort of judging the capacity of an adolescent to assist in decision making in their own care. Um, however, our current approach does make the following assumptions. First, that uh, as a general rule, we do, the legal system at any rate, assumes that those under the age of 18 are incompetent. Uh, we all recognize that those individuals possess some degree of developing capacity and that the more mature they become, the older they become, the more likely they are to have achieved what's necessary to make mature decisions. We also recognize that capacity is somewhat relative, that there are decisions that seven-year-olds are perfectly capable of making, like what color popsicle would you like or what's your favorite flavor of ice cream, and there are decisions that seven-year-olds are not capable of making, and, and uh, complex medical decisions might be treated differently than simple medical decisions. Um, finally, the developmental evidence that most pediatric bioethics people have relied on to sort of make decisions about when an adolescent is most likely to be able to make decisions has suggested that something about the age of 14 or 15 is the point at which an adolescent has achieved uh, something that looks very similar to adult decision-making capacity and that there's variability below that age. So our typical approach has been to ask, first of all, whether an adolescent is emancipated under the law, because if they're emancipated under the law, they in general have the, the, the ability to make decisions for themselves. Secondly, we asked the question that was asked in Daniel Hauser's case, which is, and, and in Dennis Lindbergh's case, which is, is this adolescent a mature minor? Do they have sufficient maturity and capacity uh, uh, to make uh, adult level decisions that should be respected, perhaps no matter what their parents have to say or no matter what caretakers have to say. Um, and then finally, if they don't have sufficient capacity to make this decision, um, to have their own decision respected, we look carefully at the parents' decision for these kids. Um, in other words, if we chose not to respect Dennis Lindbergh's case, we would still have to deal with the fact that his legal decision maker supported his decision and, uh, and, and need some uh, justification for overriding her decision. And that justification usually falls back on what's known as the harm principle. In other words, we ask whether this, the decision of the caretaker, let's say Dennis Lindbergh's aunt, is placing Dennis at significant risk of serious harm. <clears throat> 
I would suggest that in Dennis Lindbergh's case, had he not been declared a mature minor, um, it would have been reasonable to say that the decision his aunt was making at that point to uh, deprive him of a blood transfusion um, did place him at significant risk of serious harm and could have been overridden uh, by a judge. Now what I want to point out is that with this sort of construct that we use in making decisions about adolescence, we do focus on establishing capacity through an assessment of rational faculties. Um, and that assessment of rational faculties is largely a reflection of our reliance on the principle of autonomy. Uh, to give another example of how this plays out, in Britain they use, what, uh, very commonly use, what's known as the Gillick test. And the Gillick test basically says that a young person under 16 years of age who, quote unquote, achieves a sufficient understanding and intelligence to enable him or her to understand fully what is proposed is competent to consent to medical treatment without parental consent. And therefore, and, and, and along with that, a competent refusal would also be respected. And what I want you to notice here is the similarities between the Gillick test and what we do in this country, which is the focus on understanding, the focus on rational capacities. In the United States, our traditional approach has been something like the rule of sevens. Some people use the rule of eights, and I'm not going to argue about what the numbers should be, but as a general rule, many people use something like this as a starting point, making the argument that those under seven have no capacity to make any decision with any sort of degree of uh, um, uh, seriousness. Those uh, over the age of 14, in general, because of the developmental evidence that suggests that they are capable of understanding information related to medical decisions, and because they do have rational faculties that look very adult-like, should be respected unless there's uh, evidence to the contrary. And finally, between 7 and 14, there's a presumption of incapacity, uh, but that may be overridden in... Uh, in rare cases where you can demonstrate the, the, the ability of them to make these rational decisions and understand what's at stake. Again, this is our traditional approach. The problem is the following. We know several things about adolescents that seem to stray from this sort of traditional approach we've taken. The first of which is that even though when you look at adolescents developmentally, we, you put them through uh, tests and, and uh, decision-making tasks in a sterile laboratory type environment, they look an awful lot like adults. We know that in real life, adolescents often don't perform at a level commensurate with their cognitive abilities. Secondly, we know that middle adolescents are more likely than younger adolescents to rely on analytic processing, but this is not their primary reason, re, uh, means of decision making. And finally, middle and ad older adolescents have the ability to make adult level decisions. In other words, they, they in some sense possess capacity or competence, but they frequently don't use that ability. <clears throat> In other words, they, maximize, uh, they don't maximize the use of those abilities. Uh, what I want to say here is that our traditional approach relies on the fact that adolescents are capable of making these sorts of decisions. But what the data would suggest is that they frequently don't use those capabilities. And that, uh, in some ways, sets them apart from adults. Um, and again, there's a, there's a continuum and a spectrum here that's important. Uh, so. To use another example, uh, there's, there are some interesting work that's been done with uh, adolescents who have desired and in some cases obtained cosmetic surgery, um, not, be, not to correct defects but to enhance their appearance. And one of, one of, the, uh, one of these studies has, has uh, discovered some very interesting things. First of all, of all age groups, teens are most likely to be dissatisfied with their appearance, not surprising. Satisfaction improves with age and peaks at 18 years of age. Adolescent body image is continually developing. Uh, adolescents are very sensitive to how others look and what others think. And finally, body image and attitudes change as they approach adulthood. In other words, what studies like this have shown is that whereas a 15 or 16 year old adolescent may have a very strong feeling that they need their nose fixed or that they need their breasts enhanced or they need some other kind of cosmetic uh, surgery, if you take that same adolescent put them off until they're 18, they frequently change their minds. In other words, there's reason to question the authenticity of some of the decisions that adolescents make, even if they appear to understand the consequences of those decisions, and even if they appear to be rational decisions. So 
our traditional approach has some shortcomings. It assumes autonomy is the proper paradigm. Autonomy in the sense of assessing capacity, assessing understanding, and then granting decision-making authority if somebody possesses that. Secondly, most data is based on the evaluation of reasoning, understanding, um, and in that sense, as I've mentioned, middle and older adolescents look similar to adults. But again, that's because our focus has been on this notion of rationality. Unfortunately, most of those studies that, that look at cognitive assessments do not account for emotional and psychosocial contributors to decision making, factors that play a more prominent role in middle and older adolescents than perhaps they do in those same individuals when they become uh, adults. Um, the other problem with some of this data, uh, and much of this data actually, is that it's based on, uh, it, it's based on um, situations that are not real. In other words, the, the, there are scenarios that are posed to adolescents, and they're asked to respond to those, and then their responses are measured against adult responses to similar scenarios. And I would suggest that data based on situations that don't mimic the context of real life decisions, in other words, the emotional and other uh, surroundings that occur, for, for example, in a real medical decision uh, is very different than one that's put on paper and presented to an adolescent. When Dennis Lindbergh is making decisions about what to do about his new leukemia, there are emotional circumstances that would just simply not apply if I presented a group of 16-year-olds with a scenario about what would you do if you had leukemia with a 70% chance of survival. And so many of the ways we've measured um, adolescent capacity uh, do not really recognize the fact that there is this very strong emotional uh, element to adolescent decision making. Many people have suggested that we all, not just adolescents, but we all have two basic brain systems. Now again, this is grossly simplistic. We, we don't have two brain systems. But one way of thinking about the brain is that there are these two sort of basic systems that work together and are well integrated, but nonetheless, they exist in tandem. Um, and there's a rich literature that's, that, that supports this, and, and it goes beyond sort of um, uh, the medical literature and the neurodevelopmental literature, and it, it extends into survival literature and, um, and psychosocial literature and social psychology and lots of others. And what's exciting about that is that all these different disciplines have more or less come to the same conclusion if you look carefully at their data. Um, which is that largely, uh, for everybody, for the most part, when we make decisions, there are two, there's a balance between two things going on in our brain. Uh, th the first of which is that we're, we're trying to use rationality to come to some uh, notion of what we should do in a situation. And the second is that uh, emotional elements play a huge role in that. What we find in survival situations, for example, um, is that people's initial response is often a very emotional one. And frequently survival is dependent on them surviving that emotional response. That emotional response is often so evolutionarily adaptive for the most part, but it can also cause major problems when it isn't sort of reined in uh, by the rational aspects of the brain. Um, and what we find in survival situations is frequently the people who survive are the ones that are able to control that initial emotional response that may have gotten them out of immediate danger, but now is going to put them into bigger danger if they don't get some handle on it. Um, both of these systems have great value. Um, but either one can mislead, and so it's a balance that we're actually trying to achieve. The emotional system, as it turns out, is most adaptive for humans living in small communities like we did back in Africa. Um, and it respond, it's very individual responsive, it's crisis driven, it's less utilitarian than a rational based response. Now let's talk about the emotional brain. The emotional brain, and I'm not going to talk about what elements these are because if you're like me, um, you're not even going to know what I'm talking about if I talk about the, I, you know, most people know what the prefrontal cortex is, but if I go beyond that and start talking about the amyg amygdala, for example, you're going to be going, what the hell? Um, I will use the amygdala term once or twice, um, and I use it with my daughter much of the time that I'm with her. Um, <laughs> But the emotional brain, which does involve the amygdala, um, picks up patterns before we're often consciously aware of them. Those parts of the brain motivate behavior change through feelings and autonomic responses. Um, it often explains our first impressions to intense situations, and it's often based on what Malcolm Gladwell and Blink calls thin slice data. 
Uh, it doesn't bother to gather lots of information. It acts on that first piece of information. And those of you who have adolescents know that you can see this in your kids all the time. My daughter frequently, you say one thing, and before you can say anything else about the sort of to fill in all the details, she's reacting like a maniac to that one piece of information she's gotten. And it takes the next half an hour to sort of bring her down so you can explain there's other information here that will actually attenuate the disaster that I've just broken, um, broken to you. Um, now those of you who are more philosophically inclined will recognize that, that um, Hume and Kant actually reflected this sort of dichotomy of the brain. Uh, with, with Kant making the claim that core moral judgments arise from immediate aversive reaction to perceived or imagined harms to victims because of our emotional reaction to them, and Kant claiming that core moral judgments can be justified by pure reason alone with no help from emotion. And I would argue that they were both right, and that the reason they, that there was this so-called disagreement between Hume and Kant is that neither recognized that the brain is more complicated than either being a rational piece of equipment or an emotional piece of equipment. So, what can we say about adolescent brain development? It's not fully matured until the mid-20s, and most of the data shows that until you're 29 or 30, you don't have actually a mature brain. And so when we talk about adolescence, we might more appropriately be talking about moving into the mid-20s. Uh, Maturation tends to occur back to front. In other words, it's the more rational parts of the brain, those like the prefrontal cortex that mature the latest. Um, and I might add that, that male maturation is not as quick as female maturation, so that 18-year-old girls um, um, are actually much more mature than 18-year-old boys, and all one needs to do is look at fraternities to recognize that. <laughs> There's an imbalance between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala and other um, sort of emotional elements of the brain, and uh, it's that imbalance that I want to talk about. So the prefrontal cortex, we know that it's involved with high-level reasoning. It's involved with all these aspects of rationality. Impulse control, assessment of consequences, planning, organizing, inhibiting inappropriate behavior, setting priorities, the sorts of things that are, are important to decision-making but may not be reflected in sort of a sterile lab decision-making task. When you talk about the amygdala, in contrast to the prefrontal cortex, which in an intense situation is going to look at the situation, assess what needs to be done and plan, the amygdala and the rest of the emotional brain tends to look at the, the situation, immediately generate an emotion or feeling which drives a reaction. And again, those of you with adolescence can see how th this happened in your adolescence. There isn't, they don't even sort of do the rational part, they hear, and immediately there's a response, um, and that's what's going on there. The best way I can think that this has been put is that the adolescent brain is a well-developed accelerator, but only a partly developed break. <laughs> and it's that partly developed break that I'm going to uh, suggest has implications for um, how much we respect decision making in adolescence. So what are the implications? I think uh, the way I would summarize this is that adolescents have uh, what I would call PFCDD, prefrontal cortex um, deficit disorder. <laughs> They're often impulsive, inflexible, aggressive, reckless, emotionally volatile, risk-taking, reactive to stress, vulnerable to peer pressure. They respond to short-term rewards. They are very um, moved by excitement and arousal, underestimate long-term consequences, and overlook alternatives, all of which can impair decision-making tasks. In summary, as I've mentioned, there's an imbalance in adolescence, if you want to think of it that way, between the prefrontal cortex and the rational aspects of the brain and the subcortical areas, at least early on in adolescent development. They can, that makes adolescents very sensitive to environmental cues, to affective elements, to rewards and punishments. Their brains are very good at decision-making tasks, but their brains are not necessarily good at making decisions in the heat of the moment, when emotion may be reigning. Decisions may weigh current rewards and feelings at the expense of future implications. So adolescents are capable of making rational decisions, but they're less likely to do so under certain conditions, like those where there is high emotion, where there's intense pressure, or where there's some degree of peer pressure. They're more likely to act impulsively without a full consideration of consequences, 
and psychosocial and emotional contributors may interact in ways that actually undermine authentic decision making. So I'm going to suggest that there's an alternative to having an autonomy based way of thinking about adolescent decision making. For younger adolescents, autonomy clearly doesn't seem to apply. They, there's a failure to recognize damage done by not, but, but we also need to recognize that we can do damage by not respecting them. In other words, I'm not going to say we just override adolescent decision making because they're not autonomous, but um, we do not, we need to be careful about considering them autonomous for the reasons I've mentioned. For older adolescents, a focus on autonomy uses traditional standards of informed consent like understanding and information uh, gathering, but um, that focuses on rational faculties to the exclusion of the emotional elements that may impact their decision in adverse ways. So I would suggest that we reframe the notion of respect for autonomy and think more in terms of respect for persons when we're talking about adolescents. The issues with Dennis Lindbergh and Daniel Hauser, in my mind, revolve more around whether they have the autonomy, autonomy to make these decisions, whether they should be declared mature minors, and more related to what it means to respect them as developing persons who may have some impaired decision making. Dennis Lindbergh said he was a Jehovah's Witness. One of my concerns about the decision making in Lindbergh's case was that we know that adolescents at his age are very prone to peer pressure and what their social uh, system uh, finds okay. And when, you're, when your identity is as a Jehovah Witness and all of your peers are saying this is what you should do, it's not clear to me that Dennis can make an authentic decision that he would hold to seven years later in his mid-twenties. Um, that's one of the things that concerns me about declaring him a mature minor and, and respecting his decision. So I think we need to think in terms of respect for persons and uh, the principle of beneficence and think about what it means to respect an adolescent. And I would say that among other things, it means involving them in decisions and discussions. It means recognizing that they have developing capacity, but that capacity may be limited, particularly by these emotional elements that may infuse decisions. Uh, that we should recognize that even at 17, their decision making may be affected in ways that make them different than adults in making decisions. And uh, I would say even at 24 and 25. Um, and we should recognize the kinds of situations in which decision making should be uh, or might be flawed, which includes those where there's a high level of emotion, uh, where there's a high level of pressure uh, from peers and that sort of thing. Um, so adolescents may need limits within some limits, and I'll talk about what those limits are. So when we think about adolescents, we need to involve more than age in our thinking. Uh, we need to think about more than their ability to reason, and we need to think about more than their ability to understand what we've just told them. Um, we need to recognize that their decisions are driven by short-term consequences, the here and now, and less about what this means for five years from now. Uh, prior lived experience with illness and treatment may impact that, so I may be more inclined to, to respect a 16-year-old who's making a decision when they've battled with cystic fibrosis their entire life. There's less of an, of an emotional element involved there because this is sort of their life. It's not something new. It's not a new diagnosis of leukemia or Ewing sarcoma. Um, we need to recognize that their ability to project meaningfully into the future may be limited, uh, that they don't have settled values and beliefs. When a 14-year-old says, I'm a Jehovah's Witness, it doesn't mean they're going to be a Jehovah's Witness when they're 21. And we know for a fact that many adolescents do, in fact, change their values and their religious beliefs and other things uh, between the age of 14, 15, and 16 and the time they're more mature adults. Um, and uh, finally, I would suggest that the practicality of treatment is a factor that often gets underrated, but we need to think very strongly about. Why is that? Because I would suggest that the one way that we show incredible disrespect for any individual, whether they have capacity or not, is to force them to do things um, uh, particularly to use physical force to force them to do things. Uh, in that sense, um, I think the judge made the right decision in Daniel Hauser's case by saying to Daniel Hauser and his family, you have to get treated, uh, you have to have a chest x-ray, and you have to do what your doctor says. Um, but what I would have advised his medical team 
to do is be very, very careful about using any physical restraint to accomplish that. Uh, most of the time, it's sufficient for a judge to say you have to do this. And in that sense, I think the judge did the right thing. Um, but when you have somebody who's going to need three years of treatment and who is physically resisting every uh, part of the way, I think we have to strongly consider the kind of harm we're doing in forcing that child, whether we consider them mature enough or not to make this decision, uh, to, um, um, uh, to have to undergo what we have suggested they undergo. That's a beneficence consideration, um, and that's probably where we ought to be thinking about those sorts of things more clearly. In other words, we seek to do good when we treat somebody, for example, for cancer with a 70% survival rate, uh, but we also have to recognize that in accomplishing that, we can do a great deal of harm, and that becomes an important part of these equ uh, equations. Let's start to understand the adolescent. Let's start with the easy way of thinking about medical ethics. Let's take the competent adult. I don't mean the mature minor. I t let's take a 30-year-old. I think at, by the end of today, we could all agree, we think 30-year-olds have decisional capacity. Um, so when an adult says yes, the physician treats. When the adult says no, the physician may want to treat and may try to cajole, may try to encourage, with permission, may try to discuss it with a spouse or a good friend. But in the end, competent adults have the right to accept or refuse any medical treatment, and the physician has to accept that. So the focus then for adults is the right of a competent adult to accept or refuse any treatment, including life-saving treatment, and we just base it on the model of informed consent. Can you ever override a competent adult? Only if you can prove that they lack decisional capacity. Very different in pediatrics. We presume that children are incompetent. Some may want to start arguing that maybe we should start not having this presumption, but the legal presumption is that children are incompetent and unable to make decisions. Um, we can, there are exceptional cases. There are exceptional children. Parents, instead, are presumed to be the decision makers, and they're supposed to be guided by a, quote, best interest principle. When can we override parents? Well, if they're abusive or neglectful, we also, I want to think about it from the concept of basic needs. This is from a concept of John Rawls, where we all have these basic primary needs, basic uh, needs for health, for education, for housing, for clothing, and for security. Now, that's the traditional way of thinking about pediatric ethics, that parents make decisions for their children based on best interest. There's this new trend, as we heard some of the cases being presented today, to show greater respect for minor refusals. And I want to use four cases. Um, the first is INRI EG. It's from 1989 in Illinois. And uh, EG was a young, a young girl with uh, ALL who was a Jehovah Witness who came into the hospital and said, I want treatment with her parents. I want treatment, but I refuse blood products. And the fact is she came in, our hemoglobin was four. At that time, there were no mature minor statutes in Illinois. And uh, the hospital had to decide what to do and decided that it was going to treat her over her objections, got a court order, but also actually thought that she made a really convincing argument that she was mature. And so the hospital, uh, the University of Chicago Hospital, where I am now, and I was not there in 1989, actually did a non-adversarial court where they actually encouraged the family to go to court to argue that EG should have the authority to make health care decisions uh, for herself with her parents. And it was very important for the court that her parents were in agreement with her. Anyway, they went to court, but in the meantime, she uh, got her treatment. She also got blood products. And uh, a year and a half afterwards, after she's been cured of her chemo, uh, uh, cured of her cancer with chemo and blood products, the court ruled that EG should be perceived as a mature minor and should have the right to refuse treatment as long as her parents agreed with her. Her lawyer came out of the courthouse smiling and said, I won in two ways. One, we've won the right for individuals like EG to refuse treatment in the future. And two, I won because I have a live client. Billy Best, five years later, moved east, go to Massachusetts. How many remember the story of Billy Best? Not many. OK, Billy was the young man who we all got to watch skateboard in Texas. So Billy had Hodgkin's lymphoma. He had an aunt who had recently died from cancer and decided that the chemo was making him weak. So after four rounds of induction chemo, he turned to his parents and said he didn't want any more. His parents thought about it, encouraged him to have the fifth round, 
At which point he again turned to his parents and said, I don't want the chemo anymore. It's making me feel weak. My hair is falling out. I'm losing weight. Um, and his parents said, no, we have to finish this course. It's life-saving. And Billy packs his bag and, uh, and his skate skateboard, tells his parents he's going to leave his life to God's hands and goes, runs away. And then mom and dad um, crying on national TV, begging Billy to come back, promising they won't give him any, uh, force him to have any more medications. Uh, he's eventually located. He and his parents talk. He comes back to Boston. They go to the doctor. They explain that Billy really wants to use complementary alternative medicine and prayer. And um, the, uh, the state decides to try to take medical custody. Well, the, everybody in Boston, everyone around the country was livid. Here was a family who had thought about it. They were respecting their adolescent's decision. The parents were in agreement. And so the state actually takes away their um, claim that they are going to do child abuse and neglect. And uh, Billy is allowed to proceed with, chemo, uh, with alternative complementary medicine and prayer. And about two years later, if you read the Boston Globe, what you find is that the doctors start, and I should say that in order to take this to court and say that it's a suggestion of child abuse and neglect, the doctors had to say, without further chemo, Billy's going to die, because otherwise it won't reach the threshold of abuse or neglect. Well, about two years later, Billy is alive and thriving, and there's an article in the Boston Globe where the doctors say, you know, five rounds of chemo, he probably has an 80 to 85 percent chance of being cured just from that chemo. Of course, Billy is telling the Boston Globe, I've been saved because of prayer and because of the complementary alternative medicines. And if you Google Billy, you can find he has a web page. He's still um, alive and healthy, and he's encouraging everybody to refuse chemotherapy and gives you the information about the diet he's on and the complementary and alternative medicines he's used. So both Reed was a Jehovah Witness. Billy Best described himself as a Christian evangelical fundamentalist. Our next patient is going to be star child Abraham Sharik, who also is going to give us a religious refusal for uh, refusing chemotherapy and radiation. He's a 15-year-old who uh, has cancer that gets cured but then relapses and decides he doesn't want to go through it again. And he's had the experience. So he and his father travel to Mexico. When they come back, uh, he's taken into custody for child abuse and neglect. And here, there's a lot of negotiations. And finally, there's agreement that he doesn't have to get chemo. He has to get radiation. He could also have his complementary and alternative medicine under a physician's observation. And he also is alive today and speaks about his experiences on the web. So I will actually argue that none of this has to do with the adolescent's autonomy. It has to do with the family's autonomy. And that's very different, as you'll see throughout this talk. So what would the world look like if parents had full authority? It would look like if the physician said treat and the parents agreed, then we would treat. And if the parents say don't treat, then the physicians wouldn't treat. But that's not actually how it works. Parent, parental authority is not absolute. The, uh, we have the role of the state to promote their basic interests, and we have the role of the adolescent in the mature minor doctrine. But what would the world look like if minors had full authority? Here it would look like just like the case where we had of the competent adult. When the minor said treat, the physician would treat, and when the minor said no, the physician wouldn't treat. Um, maybe try to convince, but in the end, respect the patient's wishes. But again, we know that children do not have absolute authority, even when they have decisional capacity. So that's not what the world looks like. Instead, we're going to use this four boxes, looking at when the uh, parent and child both say yes, when the parent says yes and the child says no, when the parent says no and the child says yes, and when both say no. And the best way is just to call when everyone says yes, we'll call that best interest. When the parents say yes but the minor refuses, we'll call that a minor refusal. When the uh, minor says yes and the parent says no, we'll call it a parental refusal. And when both say no, we'll call that a family refusal just for making it easy and using a shorthand lingo. So here's what, here is the uh, table for his decision making with and on behalf of children with respect to effective life-saving therapies. What traditionally happens? So if we go with this whole notion that parents make decisions for their children and that they're supposed to act in their child's best interest. So what you see here is that what traditionally happens is that pediatricians treat no matter what anybody says. If you want to be a paternalist, you belong as a pediatrician, don't go into internal medicine. <laughs> Family opinions don't matter. So that's the traditional view, but there has been movement to try to increase the role 
of the adolescent, although I'll again reiterate that I don't think it's actually anything to do with respect for the adolescent and more respect for the family. So what would the world look like if the adolescent were granted decision-making authority? Well, here it would be if the child says yes, we treat. If the child says we don't treat, gives all authority to the minor, which has already been rejected. So what actually happens now, given this new movement of the courts to be listening to children, particularly when their parents agree with them, is that when the adolescent says yes and the parent says yes, we treat, right? It's in the child's best interest. When the parents say treat and the uh, child says don't treat, uh, we treat because the parents define the minor's best interest. The minor can avoid treatment by convincing parents or by running away. This is Billy Best. Uh, when the parents say no and the adolescent wants treatment, we do treat. We go to court on the grounds that parents are neglectful. And we can also assert that the minor is acting as a mature minor. But if we really thought the child were a mature minor, then that next box, when the child says no, we should still be listening to them, right? But here, we're either going to treat or not treat based, again, on a court ruling. We're going to argue uh, that the parents are neglectful and that the teen lacks decisional capacity to make an independent decision. So when we agreed with the kid, when he wanted to get treatment, we were totally sitting there to the court saying, look, this mature kid wants treatment. His parents are being neglectful. When the kid doesn't want treatment, we're going, we're saying the parents are neglectful and this kid's immature. And so again, what I would argue is that the authority of both parents and adolescents is limited by state authority and the need to promote the minor's basic interest. I would actually argue that this whole movement towards respecting that parent refusal is missing the important point, which is to the extent that we believe we have an obligation to promote the minor's basic interest, that holds whether or not the child agrees with us and that holds to an extent whether or not the parent agrees with us. So that fourth box, when both are saying no, really should look like the same box when the parent says, uh, when the, the, the uh, fourth box, um, it really doesn't matter whether the child is agreeing or not agreeing with us. Both of these cases, the parents are failing to respect the child's need to have his basic rights respected, and so therefore we have a need and an obligation to go to court on the grounds of medical neglect. That's when we have very effective treatment. As the treatment efficacy goes down and the likelihood that this child is going to survive or the treatment becomes experimental, the world changes. Because now overriding a parental refusal and or refusing a parent and adolescent's refusal is no longer can we say that we're ensuring or promoting the child's basic interest. So in conclusion, I would actually argue that the evolving position by many courts, state legislatures, and healthcare providers to respect family refusals in case of life-threatening illness when an effective treatment exists is morally inconsistent with our obligation to protect and promote the basic medical needs of minors. And I write there not just court decisions but also state legislatures because what you should know is in the case of Abraham Shariks, for example, um, a law has been passed now in Virginia called Abraham's Law which allows any adolescent over the age of 14 to refuse life-saving medication with one caveat, as long as their parents agree with them. Going again to my point that I don't think any of this has to do with adolescent autonomy, it's about family decision making. I would then argue that basic medical needs have lexical priority over other interests and needs, both present and future regarding, and it's that basic medical need which is why I think we should be overriding family autonomy. Finally, when efficacy of treatment is low, how low is a more complicated problem, or the treatment is experimental, the state should respect family refusal because it's ambiguous whether the tre treatment actually promotes the minor's basic interests. Thank you. Why should we draw the line at 18? Drawing the line at 18 is actually really um, very historically contingent. These laws have just been going up and down um, all the time. Similarly, I want to make the point that minor consent laws and mature minor laws have nothing zero to do with the decision-making um, authority of teenagers. Um, you know, most of these laws have to do with allowing teenagers to get treatment for drug and alcohol abuse, for sexually transmitted diseases, for um, pregnancy, um, and the reason that those laws that allow teenagers to get consent to get treatment for that without talking to their parents is the concern that if they had to talk to their parents, they wouldn't go get treatment. And so, 
Um, although parents might well want to know that their kids are getting drug and alcohol treatment or treatment for STDs, um, getting kids treatment is important. Mature minor is the same thing, um, at least in the legal perspective. And I want to spend a minute talking about Cardwell versus Bechtel um, to make this point. The facts of Cardwell versus Bechtel are this. A 17-year-old girl went to a blind chiropractor for treatment. Um, her father had given her blank sign checks. Can you imagine? Um, <laughs> I mean, bad enough that I give my kids credit cards, but, you know, blank sign checks. And so, so she went to this blind chiropractor, and she got treated, and I guess something happened. It's not actually reported in the, in the court's decision. And so the question, and so the father sues the chiropractor for battery, saying, you didn't have permission to treat my daughter. And the court said, well, sure, he had permission to treat the daughter. I mean, she was 17. She you know, presented herself as being 18 or 19. She had these blank signed checks. There she was. And so, of course, she could consent to getting treated. And the court there specifically said that, you know, that for a treatment like this, that's not for, you know, a really grievous condition, that, you know, that she can consent. So, you know, so the advice that I give to people in Tennessee, which is where Vanderbilt is, is, you know, if you want to rely on that, fine. But if what you're relying on is the, is the permission of a 17-year-old to, for instance, have a nose job, without getting permission from the parents, you've got to be out of your mind. It's just that the doctrine of mature minor is there, in fact, to protect practitioners. So I think that we, um, that in general, the law has not taken an, a position that teenagers are great decision makers. Um, they have taken the position that sometimes we want them to seek care and we want to eliminate every barrier that they have in mind and the, that they could possibly see. And the other reason we have the mature minor doctrine is to protect physicians who go ahead and treat kids for minor things. So not a pay on to adolescent decision making. And yet, I think we can say that some teenagers can make considered decisions about medical care. And so the question, at least for me, is what do we do about the, about the adolescent who seems to make, seems to be making a considered decision? Um, and at least from a legal perspective, we define laws um, in part because to avoid the need for individual decision making. So, you know, there may be a teenager who says, that I am 18 years old and I can drink maturely and, and handle it and not endanger anybody, et cetera. But the law says that's not a decision you get to make. We need a line that is for ease of decision making. That's, the law does this everywhere. But the question, I think, in cases like this, from a legal and an ethical perspective, is whether the stakes get high enough to warrant individual decision making. And obviously I'm gonna contend that the stakes in cases like these are high enough to warrant individual decision making. That actually have some kind of probative inquiry into whether the adolescent is making the kind of decision that ought to be upheld. I think that those of us who um, practice pediatrics um, also feel that we ourselves have independent roles as advocates on the behalf on the behalf of children, not only for promoting their physical health but also their overall well-being. Um, and then, obviously, there is a um, there is a contribution of the state in here, which again, Laney very clearly identified, where the state comes in and says that we can supervene everybody's decision making. Um, on the behalf of the child, where we think the child is suffering irreparable harm as a result of abuse or neglect. This is a very complex moral and legal landscape. And although I can say that the laws are actually quite clear in terms of what the uh, criteria for reporting are, in practice, it isn't nearly that clear. Much of this negotiation takes place at the bedside, takes place um, um, 
takes place between the parent, the clinician, um, and the child, often in the context of an ethics committee, um, to try to figure out whether a physician's recommendation for treatment needs to go forward in the face of the adolescent's, um, in the face of the adolescent's refusal. And even in the face of the adolescent's refusal in the case where the parent wants treatment, because as Doug points out, it's kind of hard to sit on a 17-year-old. So this negotiation is actually incredibly difficult and is an important moral landscape. So I honor Laney's suggestion that we need to pay more attention to families and that we need to pay more attention to um, the role that they play. But I think that the physician also, that the whole healthcare team plays a role here too, and the state plays a role as well. So it's an actually incredibly complex moral landscape. Um, certainly the cases that we talk about all the time uh, seem to have a role for religion. And I want to demystify another point here, um, which I think is uh, pretty important, um, which is that all of us, or most of us live in states that have abuse and neglect laws that say that you cannot prosecute, parent, prosecute parents for abuse or neglect in the event that they are acting the, on the basis of religious beliefs. Now, I want to say here that this is not a First Amendment issue. Um, and that it is important to recognize how these things got into the law because, um, because, that's, uh, because it gives some insight. During the Nixon administration, several high up leaders in his administration were Christian scientists. And in the early 1970s, for a brief period of time, as a condition of getting Medicaid funds from the federal government, it was a requirement that states enact laws that allowed parents with religious objections to refuse treatment. That particular federal requirement was only in place for about a year and then got repealed. But what happened was, because of the obvious carrot of, um, of federal funding, Many, in fact, most states enacted laws that provided, uh, that provided exemptions for religious objection to medical, medical care. Um, this has been an incredibly vexed issue over time. The point that I want to make here is that when you look at these statutes, you need to look at them as, a, um, as, a, as an outgrowth of a particular presidential administration. Now, I also want to acknowledge that religious, um, religious belief is incredibly important in our country, and that probably if efforts were made to repeal these laws now, they would run into considerable difficulty. And, the, and I would say also that although we talk about Prince versus Massachusetts as saying that parents can't make martyrs of their children, we also have other, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, because we also have the case of Wisconsin versus Yoder, which has to do with whether Amish parents can take their children out of public school at the age of 15, um, and in which just then Justice Berger wrote that in fact Amish parents could, in no small part because the Amish religion has a long-standing history in our country, and in part because Amish young children grow up to be good people. I want to identify the issue of religious belief and its role in American culture and American constitutional law as an extremely complicated one, one that is front and center in the current administration and has been for a long time. But the particular exemptions that exist in child abuse and neglect laws um, have a particular historical context, which may make them of less importance now. So what kind of assessment do we need to have in these cases? Um, I think we ought to look at, um, does the teenager understand what is at stake? That was also important in the case of Daniel Hauser. Um, I think uh, also in many of the other cases that we've heard about, um, and something that we need to pay some attention to, looked at in the reality of the particular setting in which the case is being decided. It is clearly the case, as Doug very rightly pointed out, that um, uh, discussions of the, uh, the ex experiments on the cognitive um, uh, skills of teenagers when done hypothetically aren't particularly probative. It's also true about adults. Um, and so, you know, we have to look at it in the context of, um, in the context of the actual case at hand.
And then how strongly held are the objections to treatment? Um, and here I would say that, um, and this is something that I would take Laney to some task force, task for, which is that there has been a, there has been a body of, that says, well, really we need to look at the teenager and, if, and look and see whether the teenager is an independent decision maker. And so in some ways it's almost better if the teenager doesn't want treatment and the parents do because it shows that they're asserting their autonomy. Um, my own view about that is that human beings are social creatures. And I think that it, it would be really sad for a teenager or for anybody else to be making these kinds of decisions without the support of the people with whom they're most intimately involved. So on the one hand, I do wanna make sure that the parents are not, you know, overriding the, the, the um, are not overriding the wishes of the teenager, but at the same time, it would seem to me a good thing as opposed to a bad thing that the, that the adolescent is talking with his or her parents and that together they as a family um, are making a decision about, uh, about how to proceed. Again, I think this is complicated, but I do think um, as Jeff Bluestein has written about the teenager alone, the idea of the teenager who has been abandoned by his or her parents and has no caring adult to whom, a, to, whom to turn is an incredibly sad individual. Same for adults, for that matter, but I would actually view that as a plus rather than a minus, so long as I don't see areas of overreaching. And the procedural issues that I would want to talk about is, does it have to be made, does this decision about whether to um, uphold the teenager's refusal of life-sustaining medical treatment need to be made by a judge? Um, and in the state of Massachusetts, the answer to that is yes. It has been yes for decades. Um, but actually, I think, although this is a course of last resort, um, um, I think that in general, that's the last place you want to end up. Um, and, and so what I would actually urge happen in the most, in the most settings is that the clinician, um, in conversation with parents, in conversation with the adolescent, um, in conversation perhaps with um, either ethics consultants or other individuals at the, at the institution, make a decision about whether, um, about whether to um, sustain the adolescent's decision. Now I realize that there are cases when uh, the benefits of treatment are so clear that it, that it becomes necessary to uh, make a report under the child abuse and neglect laws and then you necessarily end up in front of a judge. But I would say as a general rule it would be a bad plan to start from the position that every case like this needs to end up in a court of law. Um, I think that uh, that just seems, that seems particularly tragic to me. You've been watching speakers from the 2009 Pediatrics Bioethics Conference, No Longer a Child, Not Yet an Adult, Ethical Issues in Adolescent Healthcare, presented by the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics at Seattle Children's Hospital. about this series of programs, please go to www.seattlechildrens.org.